We're in this uh, series we've been in for a few weeks on the Believer's Authority. And if you have a Bible, we're going to start tonight in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, and uh, get started with talking about breaking the power of the devil. You know, it's so sad when you actually get into these verses and do a study course like this when you come to realize or you think about that a lot of people, good people, Christian people, are in church week by week and they're never taught that we don't have to be victims of whatever the devil's got going on. And I think that what happens is that when you learn about the believer's authority, you take more of a proactive posture when attacks come. People that have not been taught about the authority of the believer when sickness comes or a job loss or you know a child's misbehaving, whatever it is, they just seem to accept it. You know, like, well, okay. And then it's even worse than that because sometimes they take the attitude, well, maybe the Lord's trying to teach me something. Well, when you learn about the authority that we have as believers, I just think the natural consequence is you become more proactive. And then for 30 and a half years, I've been teaching that the dividing line of the Bible is in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And so the way you find out, the way you figure out, is this God trying to teach me something or is this the devil? Well, if there's any stealing, killing, or destroying going on, it's not God. Tell your neighbor, it's not God. Because Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so a lot of times I think we not only are ineffective in prayer, I think sometimes we offend God in prayer by going to God and asking him, is this stealing you? Is this destroying you? Is this killing you? Uh, Oh my gosh, it's offensive. Well, that's why he gave us his word, so we would not have to go through life wondering. We read the word, we find out. And I believe that by finding out, then we become equipped and ready. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that last phrase, spiritual wickedness in high places, could have been translated wicked spirits in the heavenlies. I think the best example is the book of Daniel. Daniel had a question. He went to God with this question and fasted 21 days, if I remember. And it took 21 days to get the answer. But the angel, when the angel came with his answer, said, well, from the, the, from the day you set your heart to gain wisdom and understanding, I was sent to you. But I was withstood by the prince of Persia. And so these are these wicked spirits in the heavenlies. And then also, I don't know how many times out there in the fellowship atrium I'm encouraging people that a lot of times, even on the job, if somebody's trying to sabotage you or kids in school, if somebody's trying to sabotage a kid in school or spread a malicious rumor, that a lot of times it's so easy to look at the people and I've got a problem with this person, I've got a problem with that person. But a lot of times these things are spiritually motivated. And so we don't have any authority over this human being or over that human being, but we do have authority over the evil spirits that might be driving those people along. And so he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but isn't that our natural inclination? I've got a problem with this person. That person over there is trying to mess me up. Uh, We've been through this many times, many, many times. I mean, oh my gosh, uh, with the city of Arlington, with uh, city council members, with planning and zoning, I mean, sometimes, sometimes people's behavior is so irrational, it's just got to be the devil. I mean, you know, you just have trouble believing anybody could be this ridiculous. And so, sometimes, and so what we do is we, 
we waste, or actually we don't just waste our time and energy by fighting against flesh and blood. Sometimes we actually make the problem worse. And so the thing to do, I think, is to, and I'm not saying spiritualize everything. I'm saying to cover the base, to go to the Lord in prayer, to take your case to the Lord in prayer, to make your case to God in prayer, because whatever's going on could, I didn't say it is, it could be spiritually based. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Let me ask you a question. They talk about how the cultural wars have been lost now. Okay, I mean, I, I see that, that that's a very real possibility, but let me ask you a question. So while Jerry Falwell and uh, Pat Robertson and different people were trying to uh, hold back the tide on something like abortion, is there any doubt in anybody's mind that, that was, that's spiritually based? That something like abortion is spiritually based? I mean, as believers, don't we understand this? It's this, what, what's, what spirit are you talking about? It's the exact same spirit that Pharaoh had. It's the exact same spirit that Herod had. What spirit is that? Kill them all. It's a spirit. See, it's a spirit. And so that's America. That's big picture. I don't have any authority over that. I mean, as believers, I think that if we, as believers, people who said they were believers, if we'd all pull together, I think we'd have more clout than we do. But, I mean, some people have more loyalty to their bowling club membership than they do to the Word of God. But I can't do anything about that. That's big picture, you see? But I can do something about some demon that's trying to uh, get into my child's life. I, I mean, if there's a, a spirit of addiction or a spirit, uh, and a lot of these things, why do you think it is so hard when a kid experiments with drugs, why is it sometimes so hard to get free of stuff? Because it's not just physical. It's not just chemical. There is a spirit to it. And what spirit, what are these spirits, these fallen angels, what is their business? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what they're about. And so again, we don't, I don't have any control over another human being, but I do have control, not control, I do have authority over evil spirits. Now, we're talking about levels. That's why back years ago, some of you may remember, I put it in the bulletin. I thought it was so ridiculous and stupid. Dick Cheney gave a speech and said that another terrorist attack was inevitable. And I wrote him a letter, and I said, you're not Tom, Dick, or Harry. You are the vice president of the United States. Your words have power. And I said, if you, you would never say air pollution is inevitable because of the firestorm of criticism that would come your way. But you're saying a terrorist attack is inevitable? Well, of course, you know, I got a computer-generated response. But the point is, the higher somebody is, the more authority their words carry. Does that make sense? But in your home, right, if you're the mom or the dad in your home, in your home there is no higher authority. I don't care what the government thinks. And so if you're a mom or a dad in your home, there is no higher authority in your home. So you have authority. My point is we don't just have to be victims here. We don't have to be victims and let Satan come into our homes with drugs and alcohol and uh, promiscuity and uh, porn and all of this stuff and our children be stolen. We don't have to submit. We don't have to yield to that. So the Word of God teaches us that these evil spirits are fallen angels who have been dethroned by the Lord Jesus Christ. There were three archangels. There, there was Lucifer, Michael, and Gabriel. So it's no coincidence 
we go to the book of Ezekiel, we go to the book of Revelation, we find out that a third of the angels fell. It's no coincidence. Lucifer desired to ascend to the throne of God and to be enthroned instead of God, to take the place of God. And of course, that didn't work out too well. And so he was cast out and he took this third with him. So our contact with these demons should be with the knowledge that Jesus has already defeated them. He has already spoiled them. He has already put them to naught. And this is critical because if we try to combat spiritual forces without this knowledge, I think we're defeated before we begin. Now, let's go to Luke 10, 19. And we've been talking about how that in the King James, these words are both translated power. Uh, but I'm reading out of the New International Version. Luke 10, 19, I've given you authority. Now there it's translated correctly. The Greek word is exousia, right, privilege, authority, to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power. That word in the Greek is dunamis. Power, might, strength, all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And so if we are comparing power to power, Satan has more power than we do. He's not just an angel, he's an archangel. But we're not comparing power to power, we're comparing power to authority. And I gave you the illustration a few weeks back that a policeman can stand in an intersection when the light's out and direct traffic. Well, nobody would think that his body has more power than an Escalade or that his body has more power than a Suburban. But the police officer there directing traffic has got something that the Suburban or the Escalade doesn't have. He's got authority. And so if you abuse his authority, well, he's got another gizmo called a radio. And then there's going to be backup. In other words, it's not just one individual. He, he has authority. And authority, by its nature, is backed up. And so we're not trying to compare our intelligence to Lucifer's. And here's something you've got to understand about Lucifer. I don't know what his IQ is, but I would imagine it's pretty high. But here's something you have to understand about Lucifer. He has got 6,000 years experience tricking people. 6,000 years de experience deceiving people. And so we have to understand this. We're not, we're not going up against him intelligence versus intelligence or power versus power. No. And in this, in this, we're not prideful. We're not arrogant. In this, we realize we are completely dependent. We are completely dependent on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. Amen. So it's not arrogance or pride or boastfulness. No, it is knowledge that Jesus has already defeated him. So I'm not even, I'm not even trying to do anything to the devil. What am, I, what am I doing? I'm exercising the authority that he has already won on my behalf. I'm ex you know, a lot of times if, you, if you're in management, and uh, let's say a management position opens up under you. Your natural inclination is to look around and find perhaps the most faithful person uh, or the person that's been on the job the longest and promote them. But anybody who's had a job out in the real world knows that doesn't always work. And the reason is you could have a great person, you could have a great personality, and maybe they have the most years on the job, but management is delegation, and then management is exercising authority, and some people just don't have that ability. We've done that here in church. We put somebody in charge of ushers, or we put somebody in charge of greeters, and they could be the greatest person in the church, they could be, you know, cheerful, pleasant, everything. But they have trouble telling somebody else what to do. It's a management thing. And when we, do, when we talk about authority, we talk about exercising authority, it's a kind of a management thing. 
that I, I have to know who I am. I have to understand that it's not me. It's not my power. It's not my intelligence. It's not my strength. I'm not stronger than the devil. I'm not smarter than the devil. I don't have more experience than the devil. But I do have, I do have something he doesn't have. I have the work of Christ on Calvary's cross. Do you understand where I'm coming from? And then I have to not be afraid to exercise my authority. You know, I, I can't be timid about exercising my authority. And so when you, we had teenagers in the home, you know, sometimes they go to bed at night and uh, we would sit in the hall outside their bedroom door and pray. Now, you know, we weren't screaming and making noise and waking them up, but we would pray because it's our house. And we're just not going to let the devil come into our house and steal our seed. Do you understand? And so we're taking authority over that situation. And when you, when you get this knowledge set in your heart, you're not likely to let the devil come in and what? Steal, kill, and destroy. So we should have the knowledge that Jesus has already defeated these evil spirits. He has spoiled them. He's put them to naught. Look at Ephesians, or excuse me, Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15. And having disarmed, what tense is that? And having disarmed past tense, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he, that is Christ, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So he has already defeated them. Say it out loud. Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, has already defeated the devil. Actually, a lot of the faith message is coming to the understanding that the work of Christ is a perfect completed action. A lot of people are trying to get God to do this, and they're trying to get God to do that. And what we come to in our understanding of this message we call the faith message is that the work of Christ is a perfect, completed act. What he has done, he has done. It is finished. Why did he say that on that cross before he died? It is finished. And so we're not trying to get God to do this, and we're not trying to get God to do that. What we are doing is enforcing what he has already done. Say it out loud. Enforcing. Enforcing. Having disarmed the powers and authority, he, that is Christ, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So the, the victory has been won. But how did, how, did, how, did, how did Satan deal with Eve in the garden? See, if Satan could come into your home in the middle of the night and hit you over the head with a baseball bat, put you in a potato sack and haul you off to hell, if he could do that, he would have already done that. How did he deal with Eve? Deceit. I mean, think about it. She was in the Garden of Eden, and he talked, he literally talked her out of it. Literally talked her out of it. How did he do that? Deceit. And so deceit is his game. And we have to understand that. I thought it was so cute in the song that Lisa Land, Land uh, sang Sunday. Uh, if all your friends jumped off a cliff, would you do the same? Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that we as parents are, are dealing with with our children. In other words, uh, Satan tries to come into the house. He tries to come into the minds and the lives of children with deceit. And one of the deceits that we hear as parents is, well, everybody's doing it. Well, that's, that is a lie that Satan has used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Number one, not everybody's doing it. And number two, just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's right. Number three, just because everybody's doing it does not mean it's going to turn out okay. But he, he wheedles his way in through deceit. He doesn't come with brute force. He comes through deceit. And unfortunately, our culture is in love with deceit. You know, it's, it's uh, for example, I don't even know her name. Uh, and I don't even know what you call her. The Prince of Wales' wife, what do you call that? I mean, I know her name, isn't it, Kate? 
Middleton? I think so. Whatever. Well, how come her baby, when, it, when she was pregnant, how come when she had a baby in her womb, it was a baby? But everybody else, it's a blob of tissue, mm -hmm. right? Or Chelsea Clinton now is pregnant. And so, you know, uh, the foo-foo uh, airhead <laughs> people, you know, you know, you know, baby. Well, why is it a baby? When everybody down at the abortion clinic, it's not a baby. That's right. It's uh, a mass of tissue. And then the other one is, you know, certain people, well, they're born that way. See, this is what Satan does. He, he is a deceiver. And he's got experience. And he's really good at it. So the only way, and if you notice, our culture is losing its mind and getting dumber as we move away from the Bible. You know, we have that daily Bible, pro, daily Bible reading program in the Bible. Here's, here's what I believe with all of my heart. I think Pastor Sue last night men, uh, ministered out of Romans 12, 1 and 2. But here's what I believe with all of my heart. If you get the word of God into your mind and into your heart, you'll know a lie when you hear it. Amen. I believe that with all of my heart. But people aren't in the word. And so if they're not in the word, it's easy to lie to them. But the more we're in the word, and the, wait a minute. If Satan is, Jesus said he's a liar and the father of lies. So when you have a salesman lie to you, have you ever had a salesman lie to you? No. I mean, look you right in the eye, so smooth and oily, <laughs> and lie to you. Have you ever had that happen? Oh, yeah. And you knew in your heart it was a lie. Right. But the average person that's not in the Word, they don't know that's a lie. See, this is a huge benefit of reading the Bible. Because what is the Bible? Truth. And the more truth you get into your head and the more truth you get into your heart, the, the less likely Satan is going to be able to come in and sell you on a lie. Now, see, poor Eve didn't have a Bible and Adam didn't have a Bible. Well, we can't plead that, right? We have a Bible. And so if we're, if we're not exercising that privilege, then we're going to pay the price for it. And so by his death, by his burial, by his resurrection, he has, he has accomplished a disarming of the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I think while I was gone, Austin dealt with passages dealing with that, the fact that it took, that the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was and is the greatest miracle of the Bible. So... Uh, you know, if you have somebody healed in the Old Testament, you have somebody healed in the New Testament. I mean, I'm not saying it's not a big deal. I'm not saying it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. But that's one person, one person who's sick, maybe one person who gets raised from the dead like Lazarus. But think about it. When Jesus Christ was in that tomb, and they're not sure which tomb, you know, so... <laughs> You know, your pastor, he had to go to both of them. I talked the, the guide into going to the other one. I said, I, I want to cover my bases, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I want to see them both. Make sure they're both empty. <laughs> and, uh, but don't you know that when Satan succeeded in moving government officials and religious leaders to kill the Son of God. I mean, this was like high-stakes poker. Mm -hmm. He's dead. He's in the tomb. The stone has been rolled in front of the tomb. Now, now what is job number one for Satan? Talk to me. What is job number one for Satan? Keep to keep him there. So don't you know, at that moment in time, and this is a one-time event in all of human history, all the powers, all the demonic powers, all of Satan's power, 
all of it was focused on keeping him in that tomb. But it didn't matter. Because God raised him from the dead. And in that, he made an open show and spectacle of Satan and all of his follow fallen followers. That, that all of them together could not stop God. Amen. Do you see that? So it wasn't just the death. It wasn't just the burial. It was the resurrection. And he, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Now, God... God made the earth, and I, I heard this on television the other day, and I thought, oh, my God, you know, God save us from ignorant preachers. <laughs> because there are these folks out here, and they, have a, they, they just sound so ridiculous that uh, God created the earth 6,000 years ago, and so dinosaurs and man must have been on the planet at the same time. Oh, my God. Jot down a title. Earth's Earliest Ages by G.H. Pemberton. And then, uh, then jot down a word. It's a Hebrew word, tahu, T-O-H-U. Because if you go to Genesis 1, it says that the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. It says it was void. The Hebrew word there is tahu. And it's either in Isaiah or Jeremiah. I didn't bring that reference. But the Bible specifically says that God did not create the earth tahu. So between the time of the original creation and Genesis 1, something happened. Now what we don't know is how much time passed. My point is, man, when I say 6,000 years, I'm not, talking about the, I'm not talking about the age of the earth. So when they say they found some dinosaur bones and it's 3 million years old, I got no problem with it. And it does nothing to shake my faith at all. Because the Bible does not say the earth is 6,000 years old. Say it out loud. The Bible does not say the, not the, earth, the earth is 6,000 years, 6, years old. So you know more than most preachers. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, famous preachers talking about this stuff like, oh my God, no way. So the point is, man's been around about that long. And how, how, how do we know that? How can we figure that? Well, we can figure it by generations. The Bible's very specific about this. Uh, the, uh, the emblem that they use in Bethlehem to mark the place where he was born is a silver star with 14 points. Why 14 points? Because the Bible is very specific. There were 14 generations from David to Jesus. I mean, you can literally, what do you, you know, when you, uh, when you read the beginning of the Gospels, you think you're reading a telephone directory because of all of those names. What are all those names? That, that is God laying out the lineage from Adam to Jesus. And so simply by going by generations, approximating so many years for generations, we know about how old the earth is. And we know that Jesus lived about 2,000 years ago. But we're not saying the earth is 6,000 years old. So when, when somebody comes along with some car carbon dating information or they find some dinosaur bones and they say they're so X many years old, that doesn't do anything to my faith whatsoever. The Bible is not an archaeology book. The Bible is not an anthropology book. The Bible is not a science book. The Bible is God's word about man. But you find all kinds of history in it. You find names like Darius we read in history. I mean, you find a lot of history in it, but that's not its function. It is a word about man. It is God's message to man. So of course it, he, the Bible doesn't deal with a lot of stuff. And it's always interesting to me, Austin did a great sermon last year about Moses and the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea because they say, well, it couldn't have been here. And, and you just let time go by and archaeologists find out exactly where it was. In other words, 
you're, I mean, I'm 58 years old, and liberals have been trying to disprove the Bible my whole life and then 2,000 years previous. They've not disproved anything. Somebody say amen. amen. Even though it's got to be the most hated book on the planet. You know, I wish to God they would investigate the Book of Mormon like they have investigated the Bible. How about this? I wish to God they'd investigate the Quran like they investigate the Bible. I mean, talk about being investigated. And then they find things in my, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. They find these things. They carbon date them. Everything verifies. Everything verifies the Word of God. So the Word of God is the way that we what? We enforce what Jesus has already done. So God gave Adam this earth. He made him the steward over the earth. And you know what's going on in our culture right now tonight is kind of an anti-stewardship mentality. And so uh, you go to work, you get punished. You work overtime, they punish you more. You go get, what do you mean punish? Well, they take your money. You get a second job, you work the second shift, right? What do they do? They punish you more. But if you stay home and you, you take a, a liter jug of pop and you make a bong and you get stoned, what do they do? They send you a check, right? I mean, the whole thing is anti-steward, anti-stewardship. But if you actually get into the Bible, if you read the book of Proverbs, but wait a minute, Jesus taught stewardship. Jesus himself taught stewardship. And why is stewardship important? Because that's where Adam blew it. God set him over the garden. God made him the steward of the earth. Now, if he had not blown it and they would have had children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, the entire earth would have been populated with these uh, incredible human beings. Think about it. Because Satan would not have had an inroad to come in with disease. And think about how long they lived in those early generations of people. And we can kind of get a glimpse of what should have been when we read about the millennium, millennium is going, in the millennium, death is going to be an incredibly rare event. My point is, he was set over the earth as a steward. He didn't own the earth. He didn't create the earth. But God made him the steward over the earth. And what did he do when, when Eve was deceived by the devil? Well, he basically committed high treason. Now, he didn't have the moral right to do that, but he had the legal right to do that. And so Paul writes in the New Testament that Satan is the god of this world, G-O-D, little G-O-D. Now, you don't have to have a Ph.D. to figure this out. I mean, in my house, Jesus is Lord. In fact, we bought our first little house, I don't know, uh, 1,276 square feet or whatever it was, and we had this plaque. It said the Lingerfelds were Jesus is Lord. And, you know, we had church people mock us and make fun of us. You know, we were, oh, weren't they so stupid? But to us, to us, that, I mean, we meant that. Because in that house, Jesus was Lord. And guess what? That Bible was Lord. We went by that book. And this church is that way. We go by that book. We're not just making this stuff up as we go. But is there any doubt in anybody's mind? Who do you think's in charge tonight in Austin? Who do you th I know who's in charge in the Arlington City Council. Who do, you think, who do you think is in charge in Washington? Who do you think is in charge of the United Nations? The God of this world. And that's why we had it easy for so long. And now it's like, now that this is all we're moving toward the end and all of this is manifested, we're shocked. Well, why would we be shocked? Because Satan is the God of this world. Paul calls him the God of this world. So Satan has a right to be here as the God of this world until Adam's time runs out. And there's speculation on that. You know, Peter writes that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And so 
you know, people speculate on this, that it took God six days to do the recreation, or I could say the remodeling of planet Earth. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. We read in uh, Peter's writings that he's going to renovate it again. And I'm not saying pollute the earth, but I am saying, really, what difference does it make? Because it's all going to be rejuvenated anyway. I mean, I'm not, I don't throw Coke bottles out my window. I'm just saying, I don't worship the earth. I worship Yahweh and his son, Yeshua. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I plant trees. I'm a good guy. but I don't worship the earth. And if a tree gets in my way, it's coming down. Right? Right. But we don't know that. And that's how people set dates. They say, well, you know, it must be about 6,000 years, and then they go to figuring out those names in the Gospels and calculating the generations. We don't know exactly when. Adam's time on this earth will run out. But I'll tell you what we do know. If you, I'm going to wrap up in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Jesus is called the last Adam. We know that. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47, he's called the second man. You see, so when you really understand this, what happened was the first Adam messed us up. He gave to the God of this world, the right that was ours to have dominion. He sold out. But the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to reinstate the privileges that Adam gave away to the devil. And that's where we are. And here's what we're going to see next Wednesday night. The state that we should be living in, the state that we should be walking in, is not equal to Adam's. The state that we should be living in, the state that we should be walking in, is superior to Adam's. Because it doesn't matter what he had, and it doesn't matter what he gave up, and it doesn't matter what he yielded to the devil. He did not have the blood sacrifice of the Son of God. He did not have the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we do. So we have not just been restored to Adam's place. We have actually been elevated to a place higher than Adam's place. But if we don't know it, and we don't exercise our authority in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, what good does it do us? Say it out loud. Thank you, Father God. You made an open show and spectacle of Satan and evil spirits on Calvary's cross.